Hi everyone, this is Dr. Liz, and you're listening to Include with Dr. Liz. This show is about everyone, all people, including you. It's about people and their diverse lived experience in this world. I chat with guests to get to know them, their identities and their inclusion needs. So we all have an opportunity to understand how best to include them. So together, we can create a world where everyone thrives. Bobby is a family time loving, Brussels sprout hating, LGBTQI plus identifying parent, founder and a coach on the autism spectrum with a mental illness. Committed to making the world a better place for trauma survivors, Bobby is equal parts compassionate, courageous, funny and perseverant. And apparently put herself through college while working as the assistant director of a children's circus. Welcome, Bobby. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. No, I'm really glad that you've joined us today. But a children's circus, come on, how did your career start in a children's circus? That had to have been fun. <laughs> It was, it was fantastic. Um, and I got there because when I was in elementary school, our school district had this pullout program for kids who had creativity skills. And so one day a week, I went to a separate school where all we did all day long was art and dance and anything creativity oriented. So that's where I met one of the teachers was the director of the children's circus. Mm -hmm. So when I got old enough to be employed, that's what I did during the summer. That sounds like the best job ever. (laughs) Better than what I was doing. I was working as a checkout chick in a supermarket. (laughs) Seriously. Yes, exactly. And I was teaching juggling and, you know, um, walking on stilts and all those things. Okay, I'm officially officially jealous. Okay. (laughs) Now, we are talking about inclusion today and every guest completes a questionnaire in advance and you ticked from a really long list of identities five. What were they for you? I am a working parent. I'm a single parent of a child who's on the autism spectrum. Uh Um, I am queer. Uh Um, I am autistic. Um, And I am um, also female. Uh I'm cisgendered female. Um, And I also do have a mental illness and have struggled with mental illness since I was 14 years old. Okay. Thank you so much for your honesty and transparency. Um, It does take courage. I, you know, I think it's important to acknowledge people when they do share those things about themselves. But so before we do dive into talking about your lived experience based on all those intersecting identities, I am particularly interested to know what led you to apply your superpowers to trauma recovery? Because I'm also a trauma survivor. Okay. Um, I grew up in an incredibly dysfunctional home. Uh um, And that was what led to me developing depression when I was 14 years old. And I struggled to get good mental health care. Uh And I couldn't find it. You know, let's talk about that. Yeah, Yeah, let's talk about that. I mean, when we say back in the day, obviously things may have changed since then. But let, let's talk about your lived experience. So you mentioned in your teens with depression, um, were you still in the household where you were experiencing trauma while you were going through your depression? Yep. Okay. Tell me about the support that you didn't have around you and the support that you think may have served you well had it been there. You know, the reality is I had no support. I had the opposite of support. Mm -hmm. I had destructive influences in my childhood, you know, and one of the things we know is that if a child has just one supportive, safe human being, when they're a child, it significantly mitigates, but I didn't have even one. Okay. So that first episode of depression I had when I was 14, I didn't get any help. And so I went through it completely on my own whilst, like you mentioned, trying to keep myself afloat Mm. um, in a home where really bad things 
were happening. Yeah. And then managed to get myself through that. And then had my second episode of depression when I was in college and then managed to find my way to the mental health counseling center okay. at college. I want to and pause that- there for a second before we start looking at a little bit more of that journey. Yeah. What about the people that say, if you don't have a parent, go speak to a teacher, right? So if we're thinking about a teen, is that a viable suggestion? Yeah, it could, but it would have to be a teacher that would be pretty darn present Mm. in your life, Um, you know, in order to reverse attachment damage which is what happens when you are raised in a home where you don't have either parent, either both parents are unavailable for one reason or another, or they're actually, you know, a damaging force. Mm -hmm. You need, it, it needs to be more than, you know, a couple hours a week. Yeah. I mean, by the time you're in high school, let's say you're seeing that teacher for a couple of classes a week um, when there are 30 other kids in the class. Mm -hmm. Um, So you are quite right. The, the connection or that emotional connection that you have with them, you know, it's a long shot. It's a not, don't, I don't want anybody to hear me say it's not wonderful. Mm. That's an amazing thing. Mm. But it's not going to significantly mitigate yeah. what's happening yeah. in other spaces. Just because we're on the topic and, you know, I mean, teachers have a full-on job as it is, right? Mm. But what are some of those behaviours that can be exhibited by a teen that is experiencing trauma at home that might be misunderstood by a teacher? Like what could it look like? Mm. Some of us, when we undergo trauma, we develop protector parts who get real big and they can sometimes use anger Mm -hmm. or misbehavior to push people away Mm -hmm. in service of survival. Yeah. So oftentimes it's the child who gets labeled. Who's the child that you need to look at and go, Hey, what's going on at home? I mean, I have this privilege of getting to talk to so many different people and different identities and, those behaviors aren't unique to children in coping with trauma. Um, even if no. you think about at the at the extreme level of trauma with um, returning veterans uh, and yes. their PTSD and their compartmentalization of their experiences, and anger is certainly one of those, and yes. pushing others away. Yeah, yeah, it's in service of survival. And then sometimes you have people who go to the opposite end of the spectrum. And they have decided that the way to keep themselves safe is to completely isolate and shut down, you know? So these might be the children in the classroom who are super, super quiet, who don't make friends easily, you know, who are all sitting alone. And, you know, again, that's the, hey, buddy, what's happening? Mm -hmm. You know, your curiosity, this curiosity that is going to carry you so far. Let's come back to you Uh, and you get to college and can I guess that you got to move away from your traumatic home experience? I did. So I got some distance. I got a bit of distance and that did help. Um, Still very much struggled. Mm. Um, And this was in the late 80s. So trauma and trauma-informed mental health was not that available at this point got through college got married boom right away that's when my mental health really 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 went downhill in and out of psychiatric wards um seriously suicidal just struggled with the impact of that uh mental illness and being hospitalized for that illness um, and the depression doesn't go away just because you're discharged from hospital. Tell me about what's going on in your life around you, right? So how it impacts your friendships, your work life. Can you tell us about that? Yes, absolutely. Um, My marriage fell apart. Mm -hmm. 
because my husband couldn't figure out how to make having a depressed wife fit into his idea of what his life looked like. Mm -hmm. Um, My friends struggled because they didn't know what to do with me. Um, I had a friend say to me, it's like a little black cloud follows you around everywhere you go. And it was like, no, that's depression. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Work, they struggled. They didn't know what to do with me. Mm -hmm. Um, I eventually lost my job. Right. Um, I was disabled. I was on social security disability. For a while, I was homeless. Okay. For a while. Um, it was, it was really hard. And the systems that I tried to get help in, you know, rather than helping, you know, made it harder. Tell me about these systems. I have a bit of an understanding of these systems, not personally, (laughs) but as a parent of someone that's used these symptoms, these systems. Yeah. Yeah. Um, tell me where they fall short. Do you think? They labeled my failure to get better as a desire to not feel well. Okay. Um, They tried medication after medication after medication after medication, and my depression didn't respond well. Well, now I know, being on the other side of the equation, that only 30% of people who take antidepressants get resolution of their symptoms Uh why do you think that is because it's not entirely about our brain chemistry Uh how do you think your neurodiversity uh ties in with your mental illness and the treatment that you've got and your response to it yes because as an autistic person my nervous system struggles anyway you know it just my nervous system goes up faster Mm-hmm. than other people's and it crashes down faster than other people I joined a sorority in college because I wanted to belong and mm-hmm. that's what people did and it was awful because my nervous system could not tolerate all of the social engagement mm-hmm. and so there was another place where my head says oh look you failed again to add another layer onto that, as a child, I was raised in a very rigid religious environment. Okay. That did not welcome anything other than being straight. Okay. Well, I, I was about to say, how does that now tie into your identity now as queer? Exactly. So my head went, let's not even ponder that. Let's not, let's just take that part of you and section it off over here. I mean, at least you're an expert in compartmentalization at that point. Exactly. (laughs) Yep. My brain was so good at that. Yeah. Um, So it just took that part of me and pushed it off over here. And it wasn't until I was 50 years old when I met met my wife. And by that time, I'd been outside of that religious environment for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And I allowed myself to begin to entertain the possibility that perhaps I was not a straight yeah person but again it was just another part of myself that I had to bury in order to fit in and so then burying parts of you what load did that add to the depression that started with the trauma absolutely absolutely it did because like you said it's a it's another part of my authentic self that I had to say, this is not safe to express, mm-hmm. you know? So between the autism and the buried queer identity and the depression, which I wasn't good, obviously being a depressed person, um, you know, I became that stereotypical people pleaser. Mm, okay. You know, and every situation I went into, I read the room and went, okay, what do these people want? What do they expect? And how should I morph myself into what is liked 
and expected in this situation. Mm. And then I would do that. But how does that impact you physically and emotionally longer term, being a people pleaser? I think that probably is a big part of what led to the depression lasting as long as it did and being as severe as it was. Because it takes a lot of emotional energy to suppress parts of yourself. Yeah. Let's talk about energy for a second. So the word depression, for someone that hasn't experienced clinical depression or um, whether themselves or a loved one around them, can you describe how it manifests? Like what does it feel like for you, whether it's physical or emotional? It is like slogging through tar up to your chest Mm -hmm. and then it's pain. You know, and, and the brain doesn't know the difference between physical and emotional pain. So it was pain. It was constant. It was a constant lived experience of pain that I, no matter what I did, no matter what drugs I took, no matter who I tried to reach out to for help, um, I could not get it to abate. So what was the turning point for you? You know, it's interesting because I'm I'm going in and out of these psychiatric wards and, you know, people saying to me, what do you want? And I would always say to them, I just want to be loved. Mm, okay. I just want to be loved for all of me. I just want to be loved. And I didn't have a clue at that point who all of me was, but that's what I wanted. And they would say to me consistently, well, nobody's going to love you unless you learn to love yourself first. Well, okay but how do I do that Uh right I don't know how to do that my parents didn't love me you know I didn't have because of my depression and because of my autism I didn't make friends but I finally got connected with a therapist who loved me okay and even in that day and age when there were all the ethical boundaries that there were around telling your clients that you love them she told me she loved me and she stood there with me as I roller coasted my way through the system. Um, and she stood there. And she was a constant, steady presence for me as I tried to navigate my way. And she taught me how to love myself hmm. because she loved me. And once I knew how to love myself, that was the game changer. Now I understand what everybody's been talking about. Okay, now I can love myself and I can be there for myself. Because the reality is, is we cannot ever 100% count on people in the world around us. Yeah. Right? We have to have that solid base within ourselves. Okay, I have one million questions that I want to ask and I'm not sure what the right order is to ask them so I don't forget them. Um, I'm going to start with asking if we had healthcare professionals, um, particularly therapists or mental health um, professionals listening, and there is that trying to keep an arm's distance um, because that's the right thing to do professionally. But if you have someone like you, Bobby, that actually just needs to feel loved, what are some of the behaviors that, or the actions that they could do to demonstrate that for someone like you? Consistency, uh-huh. right? If you tell me you're going to do something, do something, you know, um, show up for the appointments, be fully present, you know, not checking your phone, not, you know, listening to the door, not any of that, being fully present for me, communicating to me that you care about me by being a steady presence, Uh even if I'm angry or upset, um, empowering me. So instead of telling me what to do, supporting me and figuring out what I need to do for myself, Uh right? reminding me that I know somewhere inside myself who I am and what I need. Because the second you start to tell me what I need to do, what you're actually telling me is I don't know what to do myself. Uh Good point. People on spectrum particularly, but not exclusively, um, 
struggle with the concept of feel like they love themselves. Like it feels very abstract to them. So what I'd love for you to share with us is what are the actions or behaviours that someone like you could demonstrate for themselves that would help build that self-love? So if I were working with someone who is neurodivergent, what feels good to you? What feels good? Um, And it's interesting because if you mix in someone who's a trauma survivor, who's also neurodivergent, Mm -hmm. you may very well have someone who not only doesn't have the abstract capacity skill online, but their brain has disconnected from their body Mm -hmm. in service of survival. So part of our brain called the insula. And in trauma survivors, often the neurons in the insula don't get to develop because our brain went, yeah, no, thank you. I would rather not connect with the body because the body's not a safe place to inhabit. So no, no neurons there. Um, So it's a, it's a mixture of getting them connected with their body and then helping them to figure out what feels good. Mm -hmm. And if feels good means Saturday nights at home, curled up on the couch with a fuzzy blanket and Netflix, go for it. Yeah. Okay. So tell me about meeting your wife. Yes. And yes, it's coming into that for you. That sounds exciting and beautiful. And I want to know about it. Yes. Yes. So um, I used to do, <laughs> I used to do a Twitter chat for survivors of sexual abuse. And I met her there. Um, And so we started talking back and forth on social media. Both of us have been divorced for multiple years. So our kiddos were in the same age range and um, just, you know, got to know each other, met each other, talked to each other, you know, and it was like, you know, I really don't want to be alone the rest of my life. What do you think about maybe we just, you know, we, we lived together. And we just, I just kind of gradually let myself be more and more and more open Mm. to what that was. And then started to go back through my memory banks going, oh, I remember that moment when, and I remember that moment when, and I remember that moment when, put puzzle pieces together and she came over here and I went over there and, you know, we went back and forth across the Atlantic for um, about six years. Oh, that's a long, long distance relationship. Yeah. Her kids were little. My kids were little. We didn't want to take them away from their fathers. Yeah. Pretty amazing process of discovery. And once that discovery has been made and you have your person, what does that do for you? How does that change you? It was, I think, one of the significant reasons why the depression lifted. Because I was no longer carrying, when I was no longer oppressing a significant part of myself. Mm. So when it comes to LGBTQI plus or identifying as queer, I'm not yeah. a mega fan of which of these boxes do you fit into? Um, and that's why I actually particularly like the term queer. But yes, um, there will be people that might be listening and go, well, doesn't that just mean you're a lesbian? Or doesn't that just mean that you're bi? Or doesn't that just mean maybe you're pansexual? Like, can you help people understand what why you use the term queer? Or if you don't, is there something more specific that you identify with? I use the word queer because I think it takes me into a community of people who all feel different because of their sexual orientation. I could certainly identify as lesbian. Uh Absolutely, I could. But when I say queer, I let anyone who's in the space with me know, even if they're not out, hey, you belong, I belong. We're all, we're all together here. I do love this because I have spoken to many people that may identify as gay or lesbian and then anyone else outside of those two identities tend to almost feel like they're not gay enough or that they actually don't fit and by you using the term queer makes it safe for all people on that spectrum to feel seen right and it doesn't require specifics and it doesn't require that you're out no that's true too I feel 
that if I use the word queer, that I welcome anyone, Mm -hmm. whether it's sexual orientation or gender identity. Beautiful. And, And thank you for saying that, because I think as well with, you know, I've always had this sort of uncomfortableness that trans as a T for everybody that's listening, the T stands for trans and it's not a sexual identity. So it's, it's swept up into sexual identity um, acronym when really it's a gender identity. It is. And so I actually quite feel quite strongly about it being pulled out because I, I don't think it's necessarily relevant in that context. They're not the same thing. No. Well, tell me about this business then. I feel like I need to give a little bit of context. So after I got my feet on the ground with my depression, I went to grad school. Okay. And got my graduate degree in marriage and family therapy. But because I had struggled with mental health issues, I was told I had no potential to contribute to the field. And by who? My, by my professors. And that perhaps I didn't even belong in the field because I had back, had mental health struggles. Back up a bit. Back that That would be like telling an addict they have no place in supporting other addicts yeah but see somehow some way that gets a pass yeah in fact that gets celebrated yes yes absolutely please go do this yes was not the same way in the late 90s in the mental health field was not but I worked as a therapist for a while Mm. probably not the best place for me so I switched over into coaching I teach trauma survivors okay how to be trauma recovery coaches Got it. So I take the people who have the lived experience Mm -hmm. and I say, you can do the thing. And we have clear boundaries between what's therapy and what's coaching. Yes. But we now have people come into our courses who are therapists. Um, We have people come into our courses who are church leaders, physicians, um, you know, all walks of life. Um, body workers come in and and take the program. Um, we have right now in the program, we have, I believe, we have a, a huge number this semester. I think we have five different people who do equine assisted. Ah, yes. Um, recovery work. Yeah. Um, and so they are getting their coaching certification. Mm. So they can do the combination of trauma recovery coaching with the horses. Bobby, I want to say thank you so much for your oh, your honesty and your insight. Um, thank you. It has been almost therapy for me today. Um, if I was to take one big point away, I mean, there's lots, but one big point would yeah. be around whether you're a therapist or whether you're just a family member, a friend, a teacher, if you are interacting with someone in a point of depression is to empower them to find their way out rather than telling them what to do next. I think that was really enlightening and I'm certainly going to take that on board. I'm glad. I'm glad. Thank you for letting me come and, and, and tell my story. I think there are people out there who need to hear that there are people who've been to really dark places. And, and you have value to bring side. this world, you and everyone else like you. Yes, exactly. Now, if you want to get in contact with Bobby, I'm going to put all of her details in the um, description of the podcast. So thank you again, Bobby. You're very welcome. It's been my honour.